And with that, I will turn this over to Jason, Melissa, and Kathy. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, we are very glad you could join us. Um, we, Melissa and I presented this um, presentation at the December boot camp thing. I can't remember. Colab has so many great names for things. I can never remember what names they're using for stuff. So, um, and then Kathy said, I want to join the fun. And Kathy is now joining us for this presentation. Um, for those of you, most of you guys should know me. I'm Jason Yenos. I'm the educational technologist here on campus for the Enterprise Technology and Services Group. Um, and I will let Kathy and Melissa introduce themselves. Melissa? Um, I'm Melissa Christensen. I am the Director of Institutional Effectiveness um, here at Plymouth. Thank you, Kathy. I'm Kathy LeBlanc. I'm the coordinator of general education and a professor in the um, communication and media studies department. I was getting confused reading my own description down below. Yes, I am professor professor of digital media. Okay. I'm like, I don't remember if I put that or not. So I'm like, do we have Kathy's title on there? Is it that accurate? So we're just going <laughs> to hope it is. So, um, so this presentation came about in a couple different directions of, of one, we know that COVID kind of launched our teaching into the online, into digital environments more than a lot of instructors had previously been doing at PSU. And then from, and that's how I came about this. And, and Melissa uh, came about this because she was looking at um, feedback survey we were getting from our students and some of the feedback they were getting. And some of that feedback came about interacting with the digital environments that, that our instructors were putting out. And so Melissa came to me and said, hey, this is the feedback we're getting. Can we team up to do this, do a presentation? And I said, absolutely. And then we came about this and Kathy joined us because she is so wonderful on designing her digital environments. And we love to have just a, such a solid example and understanding of it. And so that's how this presentation came about. And so we're going to start off with uh, Melissa talking about the feedback we were getting from our students. And then we're going to talk about the digital environments and the organization of it. And then Kathy's going to give us some, some actual, um, I won't say hands-on, but some actual demonstrations of what she's doing in her classes. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Melissa. Hi, everyone. Uh, like Jason said, thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to talk about um, some high level survey data um, for some pulse surveys that we did in September and October. Um, leading with some positive student feedback. These were student comments um, in the qualitative section of the survey. So feel free to, to look through those while I talk about the process. Um, so back in the spring, the University System of New Hampshire, um, the Board of Trustees wanted a system wide survey to see how students were feeling, how, how they were adapting to this um, emergency transition to remote learning. Um, so so those that, that data we're not going to talk about today, but that's what brought us to these pulse surveys. So these are these were shorter surveys. They were done system-wide with the exception of GSC. They were done at the residential institutions. And we're just going to be looking at Plymouth's data today. Um, so we did one in September and we did one in October. Could you advance the slide, please? Thank you. Um, so this was kind of the core question in these surveys. Um, there, are, there are many more detailed questions and those can be viewed. Um, there's a COVID-19 survey section on the um, OIE SharePoint site. And I'll actually, when I'm done talking, I'll post the link right in the chat if anyone wants to grab it. And there you can see the results from the spring survey. You can see the September and October pulse survey results. And you'll see a lot more details that I'm sharing today. This is just very high level. So this question was, overall, I am satisfied with how I am able to learn in my courses this semester. This is only undergraduate data. Um, 736 students responded in September. That's a 19% response rate, 577 in October, which is a 15% response rate. So when, we, when the students started the survey, they were asked, which modality are you primarily taking courses in? So they could choose face-to-face, -face, they could choose a mix if it was a pretty equal mix, or they could choose online, meaning the majority or all of their courses are fully online. So the face-to-face -face students, um, 
it, it's it's interesting um, in all of the surveys really from September to October um, th there were some changes and we can talk about those later. Um, but so the face to face in September 70% of the students um, were satisfied with how they were able to learn in their courses. In October, it was down to just under 60. And then with the mix, which is, um, it could be the hybrid courses, it could be some online, um, some face-to-face, -face, a, a little over 50% in September, and I think it was just under 50% in October. Um, so fairly similar. Online was pretty steady, um, but it was, it was like 40%. 40% of students were satisfied in how they were able to learn in their courses over the fall. Um, these are undergraduates and they're only the, the students that took the survey. Um, so part of the survey too was collecting qualitative data. There was um, an, ex an extended response that they could type in if they were having a tech issue, like to kind of qualify what that was. And then at the end, they could just write what they wanted. Um, so we do have some more information um, to support what we're talking about here. Um, so the top areas of concern mentioned by students, and um, let me just um, quantify in September, there were 208 respondents that provided qualitative data, and there were 334 responses. And that's because like if a student said in their qualitative data, um, my mental health, I'm struggling with my mental health and the Wi-Fi is awful. Th those are two responses because they go into different categories, but it's only one respondent. And then in October, we had 188 respondents with 271 responses. Can I say, so, I think a lot of our students would say their mental health is directly correlated to their access to Wi-Fi. I know sometimes mine is, but I guess, you know, you're the data person, so. Um, yes, yes, um, <laughs> that's a good point, um, but we do have two separate categories. Um, so the first one, which is Wi-Fi software and Zoom issues. Um, if, if you were on campus at all, um, I was, we had some serious Wi-Fi issues um, in the fall, especially in September. Um, so, and that is reflected um, in this where 70% of students said they had some sort of issue with Wi-Fi software and Zoom. The majority of those would be Wi-Fi. And, and the Zoom issues are, are due to the Wi-Fi primarily because they get on Zoom and then it cuts out so they're off Zoom. Um, so they may be qualifying that as Zoom when it's Wi-Fi. Um, and then in October, um, still a high number, 50%, but there was, a, there was a fix made to the Wi-Fi that did decrease a lot of those issues. Um, the difficulty of online learning without enough help or advising, um, a little over 10% in September and then over 20% in October. And um, I, I mean, that, that was a common thread for students um, and, and it's all new, it's all new to everyone. Um, so there's, there's always growth in that area. Um, too much work or material for an accelerated term Again, um, September was pretty low, but they're, they're starting the term. So maybe they, they haven't realized um, the amount of work that will accumulate by October. Um, so October was a higher percentage. Um, students teaching themselves was a common thing that we heard. Um, so faculty not teaching well or students teaching themselves. And a lot of that had to do with the online environment and um, depending on how the course was structured and students not feeling like um, they were getting enough interaction with each other or with the faculty member, not that the, the content, the course content, there was anything wrong with that. It was, it was mainly that social interaction that they were missing. Um, problems accessing tutoring, advising and other assistance, about 5% and then I, I think it was 12% um, in October. And that online, um, most of that was done online, and um, I think there was a little backlog um, in some of the advising at one point, which may be reflected in that number, but that's just my opinion. I have nothing to back that up. Um, response time from faculty, staff, and other communication concerns. Um, I do want to talk about this one because it was like just under 20 in September and about 10% in October. Um, you hear from students sometimes that that the faculty don't get back to them in a timely manner. And that's reflected in here. But what I can tell you is that we did some analysis of past surveys. Those surveys where the students say the faculty gets back to me within this time and this time or this period of time or this period of time. And, and it's averaging under 24 hours. 
Um, it went up slightly, but it's still under 24 hours. And I, I don't know, I think that's a pretty excellent response time um, to hear back within 24 hours. So some of that is context and, and maybe there's a, um, you know, sometimes people who have a concern are, are more quick to voice it. So um, that might be reflected in here, but um, just something to think about. Stress and mental health concerns um, more than doubled from September to October. And that is unfortunate, but not surprising. That's um, common across the nation in high school and college age um, students due to the pandemic. Um, and then moodle issues. Um, they, didn't, they didn't qualify what those moodle issues were, um, but there were a slight, a slight number of moodle issues. And th those were the top areas of concern that the students mentioned. So lo looking at these and, and reading some of their more detailed responses, um, some of what they were looking for is, <clears throat> well, some of their confusion was there are, all these faculty are using different tools and they're having a hard time keeping track of where do they go? Because maybe this class starts in Teams and this class starts in another application and uh, this, this class starts in Moodle. So that, that's where this came about. And it's not about like, tools are great. Like use the OER, use what you can use. I think the students though, they, they need that launching point to understand where to go. And I think that was a lot of the confusion that they were having that they voiced in their surveys and verbally. Um, so. So be Melissa, oh, be sorry. before we move forward, we have a couple questions in the chat. Oh, sorry, okay. Nope, that's fine. Uh, so the, one of the first questions that were brought up is, um, and you would be the best person to answer this is, what do we assume students understood, quote, how I'm able to learn? Like, do we assume the ability here is tied to only the course modality? Basically, what do we, ha what assumption do we have with the question of my, of the student's ability to learn? Right, and um, the, these questions were developed at the system level, um, but they, there was input from all the campuses. Um, it, it's primarily the modality that it's referring to. Um, but I hear you and, and I have some of that um, same question that it's, it's not defined uh, very granularly. So um, our assumption is it's at the modality because the basis of the survey and the initial question has to do with the modality. Um, and yes, and students probably define learning in different ways too. So that's a great question and I wish I had um, a better answer for you. Um, another question that was brought up and this is kind of all of us on the panel can address or anybody in the in the audience too of you know students teach themselves it's a habit of mind that we encourage yes and I, I think part of that stems from if we look at kind of the um if you look at the deeper data um you know while we encourage students to you know the habit of mind of teaching themselves they're also paying for us for our service for our guidance from our faculty members and to be not you know at least be able to be responsive and and guide them in in their acquisition of knowledge. And I think some of our students, depending, you know, I think, you know, outside the modality, we're feeling um, kind of left out. And I would think that that emptiness was being accentuated in the online modality. I, I would add one thing that pre-pandemic um, on, on TWP course evaluations, we sometimes would get comments like, you know, I thought the instructor was actually gonna teach me something. This was like a big long book report. And because we're trying to instill in students or help students practice self-regulated learning, um, I know that a lot of those comments are their resistance, especially for first year students, resistance to changing what they think of as teaching and learning. And so, you know, I, I do think some of those comments are, are potentially a positive. And, and unless you dig a little bit deeper, it's hard to it's hard to know exactly what's meant by that. Awesome. Thank you, Kathy. Um, and then another one. Do any of you folks know how survey data collection works, AKA not me, know what is generally inferred by all the non-responders or can we just assume anything about non-response? Um, Melissa, I'll let you fill that one. That's a great question. Um, yeah, that, that is a great question. And you always wonder what the non-responders think. And, and there's, um, 
there is research that that says a lot of the non responders are the ones who actually won't be retained. Obviously, we're going to retain more than 19% of the students, but some people don't respond because they, they just don't care anymore. So they're not going to take the time to fill out a survey. Sometimes students who who provide responses, it's because they want to be heard, they want to stay, they want to see a change or they want to um, tell you what you're doing well. And we saw both of those in this, those positive comments at the beginning. And I can tell you the students really appreciate um, Plymouth's response to the COVID crisis. They felt safe. They, they voiced to that, that they felt safe. Um, it's not what they would like for college because who wants to be um, socially distanced from your peers in that way, but they understand and they appreciate it. Um, so that was, that was a common thread amongst the students that they really appreciated the efforts and they appreciated the efforts of the faculty. And there, are, there were also students that recognized the faculty are, are struggling with some of this along with us because not everyone has taught online before. It was a quick, you know, a quick switch. And, and there are a lot of students that recognize that and they recognize effort, even though it's maybe not the semester they expected to have. Um, it's not the semester any of us expected to have. So. Um, but to speak to students who don't respond, um, if this were like 5% of respondents, I probably wouldn't even be sharing it. Um, but where it's closer to 20 in September, um, we, can, we can draw some inferences from, from what is provided, but knowing that some people don't fill out surveys, some people don't read their email, um, and some everything's going well and they, they just don't fill it out. So I, I, I don't know, I don't have a lot of research on that. Um, so I don't know if I answered that question well, but um, yeah. I think part of that, we can also just think about our natural tendencies as human beings in general. If, you know, when things are going okay, yeah, we're not gonna click on that link to answer, you know, that Google feedback survey or whatever survey we get. But gosh darn it, when we're unhappy about something, someone needs to hear about it because I am not happy. So the um, one of the other questions, and this is gonna be launching forward, um, we all need help managing the complexity of digital teaching and learning juggling four to five courses a student must be crazy making and yeah we're all you know we're all learning new ways and in the ins and out of juggling you know new technology especially as we adapt to teaching teaching during a pandemic and i know even myself my job is an educational technologist you know i'm the one who should be understanding these the you know the most and I'm still trying to wrap my head around things sometimes of like, okay, how do, how can we make these technologies interplay work together? So, you know, I know, you know, we're all facing these, you know, working and trying to adjust to what we're, what we're doing with the, um, with new technology. So I think we wanted to connect, uh, go to this slide, correct, Melissa? Um, yes, this is the final slide. And um, this isn't meant to be um, discouraging or negative, um, but this kind of, this is one student's comments, but it kind of sums up a lot of what um, different students were getting at. Um, some felt the semester had been highly disappointing. That's understandable on, on many levels. Um, teachers have different ways of teaching online, of course. Um, no consistency with how assignments can be done or how material is taught. And, and that, I mean, that academic freedom, we all do things differently. We have different assignments. Um, professors seem not, some, some seem not to care. Others seem to be trying their hardest and struggling as much as students. Um, wasted money, if it's gonna continue, I'll be looking into studying elsewhere. Um, so that's a student who is somewhat open to seeing things um, both ways, but also, um, isn't feeling great about his or her um, term. So that kind of sums up a lot of what um, students had to say. And so this really, like we chose this quote because it kind of summarized like what, you know, my area of expertise and what, and some of the data we're seeing and what Melissa brought, uh, came to me is like, hey, this main, you know, especially this point of all teachers have different ways of teaching online and there's little to no consistency with how assignments can be done or how material is taught. And that's, that's a struggle for me and, and a disappointment uh, for me just because, you know, I know a lot of us were adopt, uh, adjusting to utilizing the LMS and using our digital learning tools. But as we incorporate more of these digital tools, it becomes confusing for our students. And, and one of the things that we always, we need to keep an eye on is, you know, how do we make this 
as easy as possible for our students to understand. And I can tell you from my own perspective as a student, you know, when I launch, you know, when I get into an LMS and I'm clicking seven different places to try to figure out where does this need, be, need to be uh, submitted or, you know, where am I getting this material? I get deeply frustrated. And so this came about, you know, working for this came about because one of the things that we talk about and one of the things I do, you know, try to make sure I'm researching and understanding is, you know, how can we make, you know, interacting with online materials as easy as possible. And there's a article I just read uh, right before Melissa said, hey, let's work on this together uh, about our quality indicators of online courses able to predict student success. Basically, is if a course is laid out well um, and is doing what we considered well done course design in a digital learning environment, does that um, garner student success? And one of the key takeaways that came from this is design and organization construct was a key factor in influencing student outcomes. Design and organization positively and significantly influenced students' perceptions of learning and satisfaction. Specifically, efforts should be made to determine the types of learning objectives, align activities with learning outcomes, and the organize the overall course by instructors and instructional designers. Meaning, yes, if we as instructors design our courses well, our students are going to be more successful and it's going to positively affect their perception of perception of what they're learning. And so, you know, the next part is, okay, how do we design things well? That's always going to be the next question that people are going to ask. Um, and so I have some examples for you. So hopefully you guys can, can see this slide. And this is a instructor I had worked with um, in a previous position. I want you guys to take a look at, this is from his course that he taught and taking a look at the items on this course, what do you think the, uh, what do you think is being taught in this course? And you can go and put your responses in the, in the chat. All right, getting some responses here. I'm going to call on people because I want to hear your justification or you hear your why you um, put what you did. Um, so let's go with uh, Jennifer Kanarnowski. And I butchered your last name, and I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right, Jason. Kamarowski. Kamarowski. Uh <laughs> why do you say you said ancient art? Why do you say that? Uh, because of the picture. Um, the picture makes me think of kind of old sort of ancient artifacts and art forms and different cultures. And to me, that's what the picture looks like. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth Rosencrum, you said music. Can you, would you be willing to elaborate why you said music? Uh, purely the uh, amplification and decibels. Those were my indicators that it was music. Awesome. That, yeah, hey, that's using your context clues. Thank you. Um, Kathy, you said anthropology. Why do you say anthropology? Because of the way I have Zoom set up, I can't read any of the text. So all I have is the picture and it just looks like, you know, we're studying cultures. Gotcha. Um. Jennifer doesn't pay attention to the text. Yep, that's right. We just throw all that out. We just look at the pictures. Um, Barbara McCann, you said engineering. Can I ask why you said engineering? Barbara. Okay, it takes me a long time to unmute. <laughs> Don't worry, um, it takes me time too. Well, when you're designing something and it has something to do with sound waves that are going to be measured in decibels, it just seemed like a 
a computer engineering kind of phenomenon. All right. I read the words. No, that's the, you're not cheating by reading the words. I want you to read the words. The words are <laughs> the words are what you're going to be reading when you <laughs> it was whimsical. Course. The whimsical picture. <laughs> I, and yes, um, Barbara, I saved you for last because you are actually our closest contestant. Um, the actual answer is this is a course on electrical engineering. Mm. And so you're you're you are the closest one to it, um, but I bring this I I bring this example to you guys because of the disconnect between our yes our lovely whimsical picture and the content that's being taught, and and so the background is this picture is actually the instructor provided this picture because he actually did this all, throughout all his course. These are pictures of his travels around the world. And one, I'm jealous of his travels around the world. And two, I love that he brought a piece of himself into this course. But when I see this into, you know, see this picture incorporated into the content of the actual course, I start to say, mm, we're starting in a getting that disconnect and our students are going to be looking at these pictures and not seeing like why is this relevant to the material that uh, that we're studying and so that's one thing we have to understand in our course design is we want to make sure that we have the most relevant material front facing for our students as they interact with this course yes we want to bring our authentic selves as instructors to this course so there's, so these our students know that we're actual real human beings that have a family that have a life outside of our our teaching that we don't just go home and or power down to the at campus and uh, boot back up at you know when teaching happens but we also want to make sure that like they're not wasting any extraneous energy on trying to figure out what is relevant to what they need to learn. So Martha, yes, you know, if you're using images that are disconnected, but for really deliberate reasons, absolutely. Please, you know, do it for deliberate reasons if, it, if it's going to tie, if it's going to tie in, but yeah, all this instructor was doing was tying this picture in, uh, image in because he wanted to make his course slightly more, you know, slightly more interesting or pretty is the justification I was given. So some of the other research that we get from well-designed digital course materials. Um, this is research that's done from Instructure, who is the company that is hosts or hosts and develop our new learning management system, Canvas. And I'm not using it just because it's Canvas. I've used this with other instructors um, or other institutions to say, hey, we need to design our course as well. They've kind of looked at different course designs. And this is the course design that's pictured is what they called complex shallow design. And what they mean by that is the navigation is complex. There's a lot of ways for the for the students to um, access things throughout the course, but then the uses is not consistent and it lacks clear intent. Um, additionally, if you take a look at this picture on the right, you have something like this where they have to, you know, they click on an area to get materials, and it just opens up a link to a document that they then have to download to interact with it. And so this, you know, navigation is you know, poorly done, the it's shallow in the pre, or pre uh, presentation of materials. And they looked at the student interaction with the materials for this. And you can see some numbers up here. 80, they had an 84% rate of assignment submissions in a course design like this. And then they had a 1.6 student interactions um, and for average in discussions. And so comparatively, when we look at a course that is designed stronger, and this is what Canvas called as a simple deep design, you can see we had a 4% increase in student submissions. And then we had a 0.5 increase in average of um, student interactions and an 8% increase, uh, not 8%, 8 um, numerical value range of student interactions per discussions. And we can kind of see the difference in how these courses are laid out. You know, before there weren't any links to anything like that. Um, you can see this one is laid out pretty succinctly with your beginnings, what you do in week one, 
um, so on and so forth with text headings. And the way, main one that I really, in, uh, really think is well done is on the right hand side, we can see the pre presentation of materials in the course. Um, you know, we can know this is, you know, a course on English, on literature and we have relevant images from our authors of Dickinson, Whitman, and so forth. Um, it's laid out with what you need to do and then specific links to get to the items that you need to do. So this navigation is well laid out. The including the inclusion of materials is well laid out. And so this is a course that students are going to be able to know what they need to do because it's listed right there for them to do. And they're going to be able to get to it because it's you know easily accessible. And so now, you know, I know some of you guys will be like, oh, we don't all use Canvas right now. This course design is important no matter what type of LMS you use. And so I'm gonna, you know, I have some snapshots of one of, of one of Kathy's class and she's gonna go to deeper dive into it later. But you can see even laid out here, this course is well laid out, it's well organized. Students know, okay, I start here. Uh, they have their date, their um, items broken up by date so they know where they need to go. Um, they have it broken up by their topic and then within that by days. And so it's easy for them to find, to um, get to and find things that they need to, to utilize. Um, and this is one great example. We have another great example of another organization style in Canva, uh, in Moodle here. You know, an image that's relevant as much as Albert Einstein is, you know, as Albert Einstein, it was completely relevant to the course as they included the, a quote to him at the beginning in the introduction, um, key questions that they're going to ask as they go through this. And then, you know, the headings and the clear design of, hey, you have your these required readings. These are your course materials that you need to do, uh, you, you need to utilize. These are your assignments. So this consistent, easy to navigate course design is LMS agnostic. It doesn't matter which one you're using. It all, it, you know, it more depends on it's consistent. You know, students know what to expect as they go from week to week. Um, and it's easy to navigate and find what they need to do. I can tell you from, from past experience here at PSU, here at my, um, uh, sorry, here at PSU and at my previous uh, institutions where I was a student, nothing dro drove me more insane of trying to figure out where I need to submit this assignment because I couldn't find the submission folder. So this is another example um, that I worked with an instructor from as we organize our course in Canvas. Um, once again, consistent, easy to navigate. Their objectives are broke down. And I know there was conversation about objectives in the in the session previous of sharing objectives with your students so they know what they're, you know, what they expect. And then similarly in the page in Canvas, it's broken out with what do you need to read, what do you need to watch, what do you review, and what do you need to submit. And that's the page for the first module. And then when you look at the module one area in Canvas, it's laid out in the exact same, you know, exact same consistent fashion with the same, you know, titles that you're, that you need to utilize. Review, read, you know, what do you need to read? What do you need to watch? What do you need to review? And what do you need to submit? So this is the importance of that easy and consistent navigation because it shows, it does increase student engagement and student um, perceptions of learning. Um, I haven't been monitoring the chats. Are there any questions that I should be addressing right now. I think it's a good discussion. Yeah. Okay. So the previous examples are great. And these are great um, for like your kind of basic online, you know, for your online modality. Um, another one for kind of this hybrid modality is that, you know, or the, or a face-to-face or see our face-to-face -face class is, you know, we, this is one that was utilized in um, at my previous job at ASU, you had a 
before class for the nice header to understand like, hey, this is what you need to do before you do before you come to class with a breakdown of things that they need to access or review. And then it's organized in the course of, hey, before class, in class, so the materials that you're going to be accessed while you're in the class, and then what do you need to do after our class? And so, you know, this is a, you know, well, the research that I've alluded to talks about online, you know, student success. This consistent navigation is, is still important for any kind of modality where your students have to interact with the with the items digitally, because even if I'm in a face to face class, once I leave the classroom and have to have to interact with the digital materials, I still need to be able to find, you know, what do I need to do right now, what do I need to do be prepared for later. So it doesn't matter where you're teaching a fully online asynchronous or synchronous online class, or even a face to face class, if you're using these digital learning environments this consistent, easy to, easy navigation is important for student, uh, student success. So now I am gonna stop there. And does, have any, does anybody have any questions or want to bring the discussion out to the forefront outside the chat box? I'll pose my question. Um, I have in the past done my organization on Moodle by modules or by, you know, the topic, which could go, you know, could be a week worth of stuff or two weeks or whatever. And although I, you know, I use the um, labels to kind of break stuff up, it does, it ends up being these really, 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 really long topics. And it, um, so then this semester I, I started doing a by uh, mainly because I was high, high flex. And so I was sort of was like, in class and online kind of side by side. But um, but I had a lot of students saying like, I can't find where it is because it's by week. And so like I, a reading or something that I want them to go back and look at, then they find that they're having to reopen all the weeks and figure out where it was. And I don't know, I'm sure it's just a personal preference thing about, I'm sure there's not a good answer, but I'm sort of trying to figure out which way to go this coming semester. Yeah, and that is a great question. And um, that design is generally, beneficial you know you have to uh, kind of understand how your how your class focuses and how it is laid out and how your materials will spread out over time and like i can definitely say like when i taught my classes i generally kind of segregate my topics into a weekly long topic and so they generally don't have to go back and reutilize um you know go back and open up an old section whereas with something you, with you that you're doing you can still organize it by week if you want and just re you know reattach that reading to that week so you say hey these are all the materials and it, just because you put it in one week doesn't mean you can't attach it again in a second week you know if you're going to organize your materials by week make sure they have all the materials that they need in order to you know in that section in order to do it um if you want to do it by multiple weeks that's fine just you know have be have that consistency so your students know where they can expect those materials to be. Um, Any other questions? Yeah, I just wanted to share an observation based on a couple of things that have been coming up in the chat. I know that, um, I can't remember who said this, but I think one of the biggest challenges when you're working on this kind of course design is um, that what works, what works organizationally or in terms of um, uh, cues for a one group of students may not work at all <laughs> yep. for, for all of your students. And so then we, we, we kind of hold up this notion that there's some perfect, perfect architecture or perfect design that is gonna solve those problems. And it makes me think of, I don't know if you've ever seen, there's a couple of like, it, like social media accounts that document really bad design in public spaces. Like when you go into a bathroom and they have to put a sign over the soap dispenser to explain to you how to <laughs> use it. And, and there are these kind of shaming accounts that go into like, look, if you have to tell people how to open a door, maybe you didn't design the door very well. But I think um, there's design of, a, of a, you know, a space like that or a device like that at a public space. And then there's course design, which I think is far, far more complex um, than we, we give it credit for. Um, and so one of the things that I really like to emphasize both in my own practice, but when I'm working with faculty is the opportunity to be explicit with your students in conversations with them about how things are designed, 
why you've made the choices that you've made, um, spending time in class actually unpacking some of your course and instructional design choices. Um, I have found in my own teaching that students really appreciate this. It's not that by explaining this to them, suddenly they're going to change and say, oh, okay, now it's perfect for me. But what it does is it helps them to develop some literacy around your own design so that they're less likely to feel um, lost. They're less likely to feel like they can't, um, they can't solve the problems that they need to solve. It also is important, I think, to be open to changing things in based on those conversations, based on talking to students about what's working and, and what isn't working. Um, I really was struck by that comment that Melissa shared that kind of feels like a negative comment where a student saying, you know, all my classes are different. I read that and I think what an incredible opportunity, like how often do our students actually step back from being a student and reflect upon how they're being taught. Like that's not something that we in normal times see a lot of. So why not really take that as an opportunity to open up the conversation with our students, not just about like what the course is, but about the way in which you're teaching it. See Liz's hand up digitally. I want to piggyback up Martha and then I will and I will get to you, Liz. Um, and I absolutely agree with you, Martha, of sharing, you know, you know, sharing with your students like this is how I arrange the course. Um, I know a lot of us, a lot of the instructors are have been going through quality matters review, um, and quality matters um, is does technically focus on online asynchronous courses. But a lot of those principles are good for just the digital learning environment. And one of the practices that they, that they do have is you're supposed to do a recording, an overview of your course explaining like, hey, this is the course, this is how it's set up, this is where you go to find your materials and things like that. And I would imagine like, that's not a, something that instructors do that often in a face-to-face -face course with their digital tools, but it's something that we should be doing to say, hey, this is how I have my, you know, the first day we always talk, go over the syllabus and talk about that. Spend 10 minutes on that first day, bring up you know, Moodle or Canvas or whatever you're using and say, or if you're using websites or whatever, you know, your WordPress site, bring it up and say, this is where our materials are at. This is how I, you know, this is how it's laid out. This is where you would submit things. If you have any questions, this is the form you post them in and, and give them the five minute walkthrough so they can understand like what those expectations are. Liz, go for it. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to piggyback on what Martha said too. Like, I think the common, the two, two things, like ex explaining why you've made the choices that you've made reminds, it, when I do that, it reminds me, and I hope reminds my students, in combination with the fact that they have these different classes with different teachers teaching differently, that all this stuff is stuff we made up that that i i'm not saying with my silence this is the way creative writing is taught like in fact i want to confess you could take this class with somebody at another university you could take this class with one of my colleagues and it would be very different and that would be fine or or not whatever like but like so that that there's a structure that I've chosen based on my own teaching and learning experience and based on the teaching that based on the learning experiences of students I've had for the last 20 years. Um, and that different teachers do it differently. I, I hope, cause I mentioned this too, but I hope, I guess the third piece I would wanna say is like, you know, within the bounds of time, space and sanity, these things can be changed. Like they're not sacred they're hopefully effective, right? I've chosen them because I think they do good things. They allow us, they enable us, they encourage us to do interesting, relevant, meaningful work. And there are a hundred other ways you could, like we could design this class. Um, I think it troubles our notion of sort of faculty expertise. I think it might make some students uncomfortable about, well, like, what do you mean this isn't the best way to, to teach the, like, you're not insisting that it's the best way. What does that mean about like 
all of my other classes. And like Martha, I'm inclined to think like, yeah, that's a real moment of like, oh, well, and, and also just one more thing before I shut up, like in as a composition teacher, especially I'm interested in teaching students about rhetoric and this idea of like audience and purpose and like, yeah, it is frustrating that different teachers ask you for different things. Different humans in your life ask you for different things. Different relationships call for different things. Different bosses are gonna ask you different things. And so let's talk about it. Let's deal with it and like become the kind of like writer and thinker who's like, right. So I'm gonna consider my audience, my purpose, you know, my available resources and that that's gonna be different every time, which God, I hear you. I want it to be the same every time, kind of. I mean, I don't really, but kind of I do. <laughs> so I, I empathize with that for students, but yeah, the meta, Martha, I'm in with you on the meta. I, I definitely agree with you, Liz, that yeah, teaching and teaching, you know, every, every class that's taught is an extension of that teacher. And I, the constant example I always bring up is the difference the way my wife teaches and the way I teach. Because my wife also teaches here at PSU and she's a very organized, structured person. And her classroom is very organized and structured. And we both come from the K-12 background, uh, you know, back and we had to write lesson plans to submit those lesson plans to our principals and, and things like that. And she had her lesson plans down, the uh, lessons planned almost down to the minute of what she was going to do and what and what and how she was going to do it. Whereas I was lucky if I had my lessons organized five minutes before my students walked in. I had a rough outline of what I wanted to do, but I'm a very scatterbrain, all over the place instructor that is willing to go off on a five minute tangent with my students um, and bring it back into the lesson. And so, you know, just like our face to face classes are a, an extension of ourselves, our digital environments are extensions of ourselves. Um, and it's going to be how we feel is the best way to convey this. I, you know, one of my things that I always try to at least harp on with um, instructors, and I've seen it in the chat, is at least be consistent in how you organize your course from week to week. That's fine if, you know, this is how you're going to do it. Just at least be consistent throughout this semester of how it's organized. Um, so we're not trying to find, you know, so we're students, you know, expect it one way one week and then have to relearn a different way in the in the next week. So I completely agree with you um, that, you know, your classroom is an extension of you. All right, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to um, Kathy to give us a demonstration, a view of what her course looks like. And so I'm going to stop sharing if I can figure out how to use Zoom and give Kathy a chance to share and give us a great example of how she has her course um, set up. Um. So I apparently cannot share my screen. I, I Sorry, will... Kathy, I thought I had made you co-host. You should be able to now. Okay. Um, so I, I think, I don't know, I feel a little bit humbled to share my course after all the great discussion in the chat. Um, this is just one way to do things, I guess. Um, so so a little bit of context. So I taught in the fall tackling a wicked problem as a fully online asynchronous course, which is an interesting challenge given that, you know, these are incoming, incoming students, many of whom because of the pandemic had never set foot on campus and were not going to be on campus. And um, the course is very focused on collaborative project-based learning. And so I was really concerned about how do I um, orient students to not just my course, but to PSU and you know, help them make some um, sense of community with, with the institution. So when I teach normally, you know, face-to-face -face or even um, online um, asynchronous when they're, the students are mostly on campus, I um, use lots of different tools and, and kind of move away from the learning management system for a lot of reasons. I don't use the LMS for much other than kind of a landing page. 
But having been through the ACE framework this summer, I decided I was going to go with the rule of twos. And I was going to choose two technologies that are kind of official technologies on our campus. So I went with Moodle and Teams. So the um, the and and I used the two tools for very different purposes. So the I used Moodle primarily as a file repository and a space where students would submit work that was kind of for my own, my eyes only. Like when they do their self-reflections, I was the only person who was gonna read that, that stuff. And so I, I put that stuff in Moodle. And then I used Teams as the place where they were going to build community and collaborate with each other and get to know each other and actually work on their projects together. Um, so a couple of things, I guess, is um, in my uh, start here section, I have a couple of videos about, how, about that, like I explained that to students and about how to navigate the course, where they can find things. And one of the things that I know students really struggle with is how to see grades and feedback. And so I had a, a video that was explicitly just about that. And I will say even like three quarters of the way through the semester, I had students who still had not figured out how to do that. Um, it's one of the things I don't like about Moodle is that it's really hard to like pin that down in a single place. And um, so, uh, it was really important for them to see my feedback, um, especially on their individual work, um, so that they could uh, revise and, and make improvements. Um, for each week, I set things up so that I, I would explain what the week was, was about, and then I tried to give an estimate for how much time each of the uh, each of the things that they, I was asking them to do was going to take. And that was an interesting exercise because I talked to students about it after the fact to see if I was accurate. And sometimes I was pretty accurate and a lot of times I was kind of way off, um, for, at least for the students I talked to about it. I didn't always organize things uh, by day. Um, I, I did that at the beginning because I wanted to help students manage their time. These are first year students who've never been in college before, figuring out how to um, take a course like this online, I thought was a really important um, skill for them to work on. But every week, even when I didn't, um, let me find another week, even when I didn't um, break things out by day for them, I tried to give an idea of how long I thought a particular task was going to take. So you'll see all of all of these things have have um, time associated with them. The um, So I think that's all I want to say about about Moodle. Um, I did then want to talk about my team. So in the team, I, I have this set up. It's a copy of the actual team that we use because I didn't want to show student information. Um, and the, the team is completely populated with student information. Um, what I did was I used the channels extensively in, in the team. So, you know, I've got your basic like ask questions and, and um, these were places where students could answer each other's questions. If they had tech problems, they could answer each other's tech problems. Um, we started with the intros and I put my intro here in, in, in the actual team. I, I started to see the value of using Teams as opposed to the Moodle discussion forums right here at the beginning of the semester. I've used you know, the, the discussion forums in the past for students to put their intros in and you know, have some sort of requirement that they then respond to three of their peers or something like that. And the conversations tend to be fairly stilted. And what happened here in Teams pretty quickly was students started sharing 
uh, lots of information, like they had conversations more like what they might have in a in a, cla a face to face classroom setting. They shared uh, the handles of their other social media platforms so that they could meet with each other outside of class. So that was really, really exciting to see. Um, I, I set up each of the projects in the course so that right here, it doesn't look like I did, did this, but in the actual class for each project that the students were gonna be working on, I set up hidden channels or private channels for each group. So I had for this first project, I had, I think it was like eight different channels. Each student could only see the channel for the group that they were in. And what I did was in the file sections of those, of those channels, I put in the documents that they would be needing to respond to, to use to as kind of a template for their collaboration together. So each, each of these documents, they would start to build like their annotated bibliography. They might start it in other documents that they, they would store here, but the ultimate annotated bibliography, they built collaboratively together right here in, in the um, team channel for their group's channel for that particular project. At the end of the semester, it was um, interesting to read students' feedback. And, and I think some of this, I'm gonna stop sharing now. I think some of this was alluded to in the chat. I had students who wrote comments like, it was great. I made friends. I actually felt like I, I know people as, as a result of having taken this class. And I was really excited to read comments like that. But at the same time, I also had comments from students that said things like, I felt completely isolated. And some of those comments came from students that on the face of it, they looked like they were fully engaged in the, in the class. And so it was kind of surprising to see see those comments. And by the way, they um, the reason I know who made those comments is because they they did self reflections. It's a you know part of the TWP class that they're doing self reflections about the habits of mind. And the, those comments came from those those essays that they had written. So I think that's that's all I um, all I wanted to say. Yeah, I think you can just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a question if, if somebody has them. Kathy, I have a question. It's Denise. I'm wondering, I did the same thing, but I haven't made the leap from discussion boards to Moodle, which I can't stand. I'd like to do them in teams, but I'm, I'm wondering, were you grading those discussion or were they just, you know, to kind of get things going? Well, I, I didn't uh, I didn't talk about this, but I, I was using ungrading this semester. And so everything was about giving feedback on things. And so, um, you know, I had I like for the intros, I ha asked them to respond to three people, but the they either did it or they didn't do it. So it wasn't like I was looking at kind of the quality of stuff. Instead, I was just giving students feedback like okay, you responded to three of your peers, but, you know, did you, re were you really curious about that based on your question? So it was, it was a little, uh, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. not graded the way that you're talking about. Yeah. There are ways to see um, how students, how, how much they've contributed to, to stuff. Cause that's one thing that I, I struggled with a little bit. Teams has a little bit of a bug of some sort where I would not always be able to see all of the all of the posts, and when I and I, the only reason I knew that was because I I said to a student, "Hey, you haven't responded to anybody," and the student took a screenshot showing me that they had. I could not see that see that stuff, and I ended up having to shut down my computer, start it back up, and then I could see them. I reported the the this little bug, but I I don't know that there's a real mm -hmm. fix for it. Thank you. So one of the things I'm seeing in the chat is, you know, about the cumbersome or the using both learning management system and a 
and like teams as a secondary thing. And one of the things that Kathy did, is, and, and Martha talked about this, is you can make a link in Teams that you can then put into either Moodle or Canvas. So it links directly to the, um, the team that they would need to go to. I can show that actually. Um, Please. I, I, sorry, I didn't, um, I forgot to mention that. So let me um, share my screen again. Uh, so right here, what I did was I created an HTML block that has an image in it. But when you click on that image, it brings you out to Teams. And most students then installed the, the desktop version of Teams. If you didn't install the desktop version, you'd see this pop up in the browser. So that link always could bring students right to the team that, that to, to the Teams application and to the team that they're, that they're in for um, this class. Very easy, you know, it's a two second thing to set up. And so when you have that consistent navigation or that easy to use navigation, you know, and like we talked about, you go over at the beginning of your class and say, hey, this is where you need to go to. It will be really easy for your students to start utilizing that tool, even though, like we talked about, you know, we want to make sure we're just organized in, in how we present those, um, present those for our students to utilize it. Any other questions or comments that you guys want to want to talk about? We we're done with our prepared materials. Now it's a free for all open open forum time. Can I just comment on Martha's comment? So I agree, missing stuff in Teams, I had no problem with missing stuff and it happened. The only reason it mattered at the beginning was because I wanted to make sure that students had a habit of going to Teams and knowing that they were going to Teams. And so I had put in this count, you've got to respond to this many of your peers. Later discussions, I didn't worry about it because I, I just figure that's part of the, the work of working on these projects and the results are going to be um, evident in the, the project itself. Yeah, Kathy, I wasn't trying to suggest that at all about yours. In fact, I think one of the things that's a little bit tricky when you're using a new tool like that is you want to make sure everybody can find it, right? Like everybody's there, they're comfortable using it. And so if you're not seeing them in there, you're missing their activity. That can make the startup a little bit um, a little bit rough. But yeah, like once it's off and running and it gets lively, I feel like that's a great thing if I'm missing stuff. Kathy, can I ask a really like technical, this, sorry, this is Heather Doherty. <laughs> Forgot that you wouldn't necessarily recognize my voice. Can I ask a really I sort of technical, <laughs> a really technical sort of question about your Moodle? I saw that you had those ta tabs at the top. Yep. And I have never seen that before. Where, where do you? It, it's weirdly called one topic. You know, you can change the, the format that you're using and, and the default is topic. When you go in and look at the options, one topic is is the one that gives you tabs. I would never have guessed that. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it doesn't make sense as a name. <laughs> and for those of you guys who are talking about wanting to recreate that, and, but you're late to the game because we're switching to Canvas. I can work with you on doing something similar to the, like that in Canvas. It's just not as accessibility friendly, but there is ways to do that and uh, do some similar stuff to that in Canvas. Other questions or comments? All right, then we're not going to hold you guys hostage. So you have. Yes, we are. Nobody can leave until 11.30. <laughs> so you have 25 minutes of extra time in your life, or as Melissa calls it, found time that you can, you know, do as you wish. But we thank you for coming, and we hope this was useful. And please, if you have questions, do follow up. We want to be helpful. Thank you guys so much. Um, uh, Christina, if you can stop.